So, um, last time we were talking about decidability and undecidability, and um, the previous lecture I had given you a proof that uh, certain languages are undecidable. And last time I started talking about diagonalization, and um, I, I said I was going to show you an, another proof uh, using diagonalization that there are undecidable languages, and in particular, um, ATM is undecidable. And so that's what I want to do starting today. So, um, remind you of what ATM is. ATM is the set of uh, languages, is, is, is a language where um, the input looks like this. This is a description of a Turing machine, and this is some input to that Turing machine, such that M accepts W. Okay? So we're, th this is a perfectly good description of a language. It's a set of strings. It's a set of strings that has some particular property. Um, I, I guess I could maybe make this more explicit. M is a Turing machine that accepts W. Okay, and we've already proven that this is undecidable. There's no other Turing machine. There's no Turing machine that can take in a description of, um, they can take in this and decide whether or not uh, M accepts W, okay? And we did that by self-reference, um, and you should really, I, th I personally think that's kind of a, a mind-twisting kind of um, uh, puzzle sort of proof, and you need to go through it line by line to, and there aren't that many lines, to convince yourself that that's right, and then try to close your eyes and put it all together in, in one, uh, one big picture. Now, this is the crux of uh, undecidability and non-computability and the fact that they're uh, and Gödel's proof and there's a whole big book I'll bring it in someday called Gödel, Escher, and Bach that's all about this kind of self-reference um, and and so on. So it's uh, anyway it's an, it's an interesting idea to get straight. Okay, but today I'm going to show you a different way of proving that um, ATM is undecidable. by diagonalization. Okay, the first thing to establish is that the set of Turing machines is countable. Well, last time we talked about what countable means. Countable means that that, that set, the set of objects, so this, in this case the set of Turing machines, can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. So i.e. there is a one-to-one -one and onto correspondence uh, between the Turing machines, the set of Turing machines, or the elements in the set of Turing machines, and the natural numbers, n. Anybody have any idea how you you exhibit this correspondence? No? Well, every Turing machine, we've, of course, this has been a, 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 what I'm about to say has been something um, we've said and used many, many times. Every Turing machine, any particular Turing machine, is described by a string over some particular uh, alphabet. In fact, um, we can fix a finite alphabet once and for all that can describe all the different Turing machines. Okay, So each Turing machine is described, or can be described, by a string in some fixed alphabet. I mean, we, we talked about this when we were looking at universal Turing machines and how do you code a Turing machine on the input tape for the universal Turing machine. Um, we need 
you know, basically a binary alphabet plus some punctuation marks to separate the transition functions. And uh, but that's about it. I mean, you can see, we argued that there's a finite alphabet, finite size alphabet that would work to um, describe any uh, to describe the entire set of, Tur of Turing machines, of all possible Turing machines. Uh, and it's not even that very, it's not even that big. I mean, binary wouldn't, doesn't seem like it's going to be uh, big enough. Um, no, actually, binary might work. You could just encode all numbers in unary, and then just have another um, symbol zero, for example, as the punctuation mark. But anyway, that doesn't really matter. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let you have ASCII, 256 characters or whatever. That's certainly sufficient. Okay, but this is, a, this is an important technical point. All right, so each Turing machine is described by some string. All right, so uh, if you have a fixed alphabet, how many, let's say it has 256 characters in it, how many strings of length one can there be? Two hundred fifty-six, and how many strings of length two can there be? Yeah, two hundred fifty-six squared. And so, how many strings of length k can there be? Two hundred fifty-six to the k. So, for every length, there's a finite number of strings that are uh, that are possible. So, for any for every length k. There are only size of the alphabet raised to the k strings of that length. Okay. Now some of those strings describe a Turing machine, and most of them don't. Okay, but certainly within. Um, this str these strings, if there's a Turing machine that can be described in k symbols, it's going to be within the set of strings. Okay, so certainly any Turing machine that can be uh, described. With k symbols, or well, in a string of length k from sigma, will be in the sigma to the k strings. Okay. Now, is there a one-to-one -one correspondence between the set of all strings over this alphabet and the natural numbers? One to one and on to the correspondence. Yeah, you just you know you have all the strings of length one followed by all the strings of length two, followed by all the strings of length three, and so on. And for any length k, that will eventually be in the list at some finite distance from the start. It, none of these sets for no k is this set infinite. These are all finite. So I can list. All strings of length one, dot, 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 followed by all strings of length two, they are those ones, and then all strings of length three, more of them, and then, you know, as we go down, all strings of length k for any fixed k. And my point again is that this, this list here is going to be finite for any particular k. So I can now put these strings in correspondence with the natural numbers by just saying this is string 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. However many of this happens to be. Let's say 250. Oh, that was the 256 squared if we're talking about the ASCII alphabet or whatever. And then um, the next one is 256 squared plus 1, you know, and so on. I just number these in order in the natural ordering. So uh, now I have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the um, set of all strings 
over this alphabet and the natural numbers. And some of these are, um, uh, some of these represent Turing machines and some of them don't, okay? Uh, so I could also, if I want to, just go through here and clean up and remove any of these that are not, that don't describe Turing machines. But the fact that I can put the, the strings in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers, and then I can go and clean up, throw away any of the ones that are, um, that are not Turing machines, then it, certainly I can put the Turing machines in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. Okay. So I can think of the following thing. I can think of a table. This is conceptual. I can think of a table that with my correspondence, with the correspondence between Turing machines and the natural numbers, I can have a table which enumerates all Turing machines along here. And this is just in, in the order given by their correspondence to the integers. 